name's Roxy, and I'm a viber. I vibe from when the sky fell. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was visiting old London town with me ma'am. Dear ma'am, it's there so much. Old London town was full of people. Everywhere you looked you would see people, and cars, and buses, and big airplanes floating overhead. There was lots of people in them days. Not like now. Everyone lost someone when the sky fell. We was in this crowd of people, all hustling and bustling our way towards the underground train. Then I felt her grip on my hand go tight, tighter than ever, and I realised that everyone had stopped. They just stood and stared up. I did too, but they was all pressed so close around me and my ma'am that all I could see was a tiny bit of blue sky straight up. I watched as a black shadow passed across it and all the people started screaming and pushing past me mum and me. So as they rushed they spread out so I could see way across the river. There was a mountain falling from behind the sky, all red with fire and leaving a trail of smoke that behind that drew a line like the sky was cut in half. There was yellow bits that broke away like babies trying to keep up. Me and mum dragged me to the top of the stairs when some big bloke stumbled into her. He stood on my foot as well and it hurt so bad that I never realised I had let go of mum's hand. I remember holding onto the pole that the underground railway sign was fixed to. The sign was a big circle with a line through the middle and it was strong so the people pushing past couldn't shift me. Even though there was all these people pushing round me, I was alone without me ma'am. I screamed and screamed for her, but she was gone. Then there was a flash from beyond the buildings across the river. The ground shook and the wind sucked my voice away. The mountain must have fallen to the ground a long way away and crashed through huge chunks upwards. I figured that it must have been the view of Burgot as it flew over the buildings and looked down at the rooftops and streets. But I wasn't looking down. I was looking across the river as whole chunks of the city tipped over towards me then turned to dust. Then the river itself was scooped up and dumped all over where I was clinging to this post. The wind was so hot but I was soaked so that kept me cool. There was no air in that wet wind. I guess I was only little and didn't need much air but I got so tired that I let go of the post and fell down. I don't know how long I slept for, but when I woke, everything was silent, except the fires burning here and there, and the cawing of the crows. I saw the doorway was the only thing still in shape. Inside the station was all collapsed, and above ground was mostly flattened. I just wandered around, stepping over stuff and crying for me ma'am. I shook some of the people I saw laid in amongst the broken stuff. They didn't move, because they wasn't asleep. I guess the wind had broken everything. I felt all hurt and lonely and hungry. I got so lost that when I reached where the river used to be, I just sat down and cried and cried. As it got darker, I noticed a little movement way further down the riverside. I got scared when I realised there was rats coming out of every crack in the ground. There were so many of them that they covered the dry riverbank like a carpet. I didn't know what to do and I got even more scared as they moved closer. That was when Janine found me. I felt like running when I saw her coming down the step towards me. But I was all cried out and too tired to run. She said she followed the sound of me crying. As she picked me up and carried me away from them rats, she said, No place for young lady, in her funny accent. Janine had come from her home country to work as a nanny for a rich family in London. They was lost now, so I guess looking after little me made her feel a bit better. 
She was kind to me. But something in her eyes made me think she could be tough as well. If she had to be. We got back to the broken streets and joined this group of people. There seemed to be quite a few little huddles of people streaming out of London. Some was screaming and crying. Some was quiet like they had nothing to say. All headed away from the city with its smells and its rats and its flies. We walked for what seemed like ages. The clouds in the sky got darker and the air got colder. And that's my memory of the next few weeks. Always being cold as we moved from place to place. Living off what we could find in broken shops. Janine got sweet with the guy we met when we joined this crowd headed north. His name was Ivan and he had come from his faraway home to live here. I think he was quite a bit older than Janine. He was tall and strong and she called him Sir Ivan, her knight in shining armour. Most of the group we was with got sick. Some kind of fever. So bad, it was like it burned them right up. I felt so bad for them, all sweaty and moaning in their sleep. I'd mop their brow with a cloth, hoping it might make them feel better. They didn't seem to notice me doing it though, and by morning, they'd be cold and still. Ivan took Janine and me away hoping we hadn't caught it. There was just the three of us. We travelled a long way till the countryside didn't look so broken and we settled in a forest beside a river. Havenwood it was called. Ivan showed us how to find shelter and trap the rabbits that burrows into the hillsides nearby. But still it got colder and darker and there were thin clouds like the low grey ones that never cleared from above us. Ivan said it was a new clear winter and all the trees in Havenwood were going to lose their leaves. He was right. We made a shelter and covered it with dead leaves. We could burn logs to keep warm and managed to get by. We played with that rabbit stew every day kept us going until, after a few months, the sky slowly began to clear. I asked Ivan if this was a new clear springtime, and he just laughed. As things began to warm up, Ivan went out, a week at a time, searching for other group survivors. He said, what with the sky fallings and the plagues, there was no one for miles, and we would be safe hidden in Havenwood without him. I missed him when he was away. That would make me miss everyone, especially my mum. Janine would catch me being sad and put her arms around me to help make me feel better. Everyone or someone, she would say. But it didn't help really. I would feel sad until Ivan came back. He wanted to map where all the other Vivers was gather us to join into one big tribe, society he called it, and he would tell us stories of the few people he met in the lands around us. The sun would shine for hours on Sundays. I would help Janine plant stuff and would have to be careful the rabbits didn't eat everything we could grow. Janine kept watch and saw Ivan returning to Havenwood one day. She covered me with leaves and as Ivan came back into the forest, I jumped up and shouted. Ivan pretended to be surprised and pretended to be cross. He chased me and caught me and tickled me and we all laughed. It was the closest thing to happy we had tasted in a long time. Then, one day, Ivan came back from one of his journeys with an angry look on his face. I heard him tell Janine that he had heard of some people to the south who were just 
disappeared completely. Someone had told him that there was more to the sky fallings than first thought. There had been fallings all over the world, and it was no accident. Ivan said something was trying to take over, and some bad men were helping them. There was this man who travelled around and made friends with any groups of people he could find. But as soon as this bloke knew where they were hidden, he would leave, and the next day the people would all be gone. Well, Janine didn't believe him; said he must have misunderstood. But Ivan was in a right state. He said we should take steps. He thought we might soon have to fight, and it would be safer joining with another group of fighters, if they would have us. We packed some stuff and got ready to go and see for ourselves. Felt sad leaving my home, even for a little while. I followed behind Janine and Ivan through the clearing, past the piles of wood that Ivan had stacked so neatly, ready for winter. We turned right at the twisted, Y-shaped dead tree, cleared the bushes, and headed for the crossing point. I said a quiet goodbye to my home. I knew every little path and tree in Havenwood, and I thought how the rest of the countryside seemed so big and unknown to me now. We crossed the little stream. It seemed shallow, but I knew it could get deep just after heavy rains, so it was handy to know the easiest place to get across. We walked for a day and a half, eating food that Janine had packed, like we was on a picnic. But Ivan wasn't himself. He sounded all bad-tempered when he talked to us both. When I asked, "Are we nearly there yet?" he got angry. Janine said he was just tired, but I knew there was something more on his mind. When we stopped, Ivan showed us a cave where he had found the people who had told him of the vanishings. Only they wasn't there either. This made Ivan even more cross. Janine was worried and said that we should go, but Ivan insisted on searching the next valley and all along the river that ran down the middle of it. Nothing, not a sign of them. Ivan was really cursing and muttering all the time, but agreed with Janine that there was no point staying around. We started the long trek home. We had only been walking a while when we heard a whistling sound in the distance. Over the hilltop rose this shining, glowing ball of light. It wasn't as bright as the sun, but the way that the colours swirled around made it hard to tell where the ball ended and the shine began. I was thinking how perfectly round it was when Ivan grabbed me and pulled me under cover. As it rose up, still making its hissy, scrapey noises, we heard another sound. Screams. It was people screaming. Below the glowing ball was a lot of rods sticking down. They showed black against the light of the ball, and ran down to wrap around a big cage that the ball was heaving into the air. I saw arms and legs sticking out through the twisting barge of the cage, as if people were piled in on top of each other. As the shadow passed over us, we ducked deeper into the grass we was hiding in. I could clearly hear the poor souls moaning and crying, as if they were so crammed together that they couldn't scream any more. After it swung around the far end of the valley and out of sight, we moved out of the grass to peer down into the next valley. We saw another glowing ball 
at the top of a cage which was sitting on the ground. The front was open and there was a huddle of people cowering in front of it. There was being shepherded into the cage by a circle of smaller glowing balls, hovering globes, Ivan called them. These were not perfectly round, like the huge one we, that we'd seen lug the cage into the air. Although they did float above the ground the same, at about the height of a tall man's head. These smaller ones had the front peeled open like petals. There was a red light inside, like an angry eye. They circled round the raggedy dressed people and slowly closed in, shepherding them towards the cage. One group of people made a break for it, but the hover globs all ganged up on them and shot them with lots of lightning bolts which threw them back into the crowd. Once the crowd had been bullied into the cage, the bars wrapped around to close up and the large ball lifted them into the air. As it carried them away, the hover gloves began to spread out, as if they were looking for stragglers. A few of them was going to pass close to us, so Ivan decided that it was time to go. We began to head down the hillside, so we could turn north towards Havenwood. That was when I noticed him. On the hilltop over the way, silhouetted against the sky, a man was watching us. He didn't move, just stood there, staring. I pointed him out to Ivan. He seemed to recognise the man. He called him collaborator and hurried us up as we tried to get away. Then I heard the man shouting. I looked back and saw him waving his arms and pointing at us. He was giving us away to the hover globs. Ivan wasn't going to have that. He picked up a rock and made to throw it at the collaborator. But, just as he brought his arm back, all the hover globs crested the brow of the hill and turned their angry red eyes towards us. So we ran. Then it began to rain, just a drizzle to start with. I felt it misting on my face. Then it rained harder. The nearest hover glove fired one of its lightning bolts at us. It hit the ground a few feet behind my heels. It missed me, but I felt a fizzing in the air, which did make me run a bit faster. Just before we ran into some woodland, Ivan made us stop. He pointed back at the hover globs. They had slowed right down, and the curved petals at the front had closed to hide the single red eye. Ivan said that it was because they didn't like the rain. I said I didn't like it either. But Janine reckoned that the rain was our friend. Somehow, it had helped us to get away. We didn't stop when night started to fall. And by morning, it looked as if we had left them far behind. But, just when it looked like we were going to make it back to Havenwood, the rain stopped. It all went quiet. There was no bird singing, and even the wind died away to nothing. Ivan had a bad feeling and tried to hurry us along as we were so close to home. I was so tired, but managed to break into a run, 
It was a good job I did, because Janine looked back the way we had come and screamed. I looked back and saw there was three hoverglobs chasing us. They was moving fast over the grass-covered rabbit burrows. One of their lightning bolts fired straight at us and skewered right through poor Janine. She didn't even have time to shout. Just fell to the ground with her eyes wide and dead and staring up at me. I was screaming now. I couldn't move. Just stood there over poor Janine, screaming as if that could bring her back. Then Ivan had his hands on my shoulders. He shook me and shook me until my eyes moved off Janine's face and looked at him. Through my shock at losing Janine, I realized Ivan was shouting at me to run for the forest. I remembered we was being chased and all I could think of was if I could get to Havenwood, then I could hide and be safe. Again, I realised I was running. My feet pounded the ground and I had to drag my air past my teeth into my lungs. Then, above the sound of my wheezy breaths, I could hear hoverglob lightning bolts going off behind me. I even must have stayed back, tried to fight them and distract them while I got away. I was too out of breath to even call his name. But the bolts had stopped now, so I guess that was the end of him. Poor Ivan. Poor Janine. Poor me. I just ran and ran. I waited for a bolt to crackle and get me in the back. The second stretched longer than I thought I was going to get away with. Why hadn't they shot me? Had they lost me? It was as if they wanted me, but not dead. Then, up ahead, I saw him running towards me. It was the collaborator, and he was on track to get me before I reached the riverbank. I must have been do a bit of luck then, because he tripped a bit. His foot went into a rabbit burrow. That made him just stumble enough for me to slip past him and start to leave him behind. Only, being older than me, his legs were longer. Those thin, bony legs of his could take bigger strides, and he was gaining on me. Somehow, I managed a bit more speed. I was so determined that he wasn't going to catch me. I knew a place where there was a shallow bit of river where I could cross, and I ran through the water with the man just behind me. I felt his hand trying to grab my hair from behind. I jerked my head forwards, and his hand closed over a few wispy strands. They stung as they was plucked from my head. By then, he had misjudged his way and was slowed as he fought through deeper water. So I made it to the bank first and squelched up the muddy rise as fast as I could. I felt like cheering myself, but I was so out of breath I could barely keep going. I realised that if I could get in amongst the trees, the narrowing pathways that I knew so well would make it impossible for him to follow me. He was still on my tail though. I had given him a good run because his breathing was so raspy I could hear him just behind me. Why did he want to catch me so bad? What had I done to make him so nasty? Past the bushes and left at the Y-shaped tree trunk. I knew I could lose him if I could get over the piles of wood into the next clearing. I cleared them with my foot on top and landed in the break and beyond. I crouched down and threw myself under the low branches. I thought I'd made it. I nearly had, 
that he had a hand on my ankle and grabbed it tight. I flopped onto my belly and my face ploughed into the leaves on the forest floor. Then I heard a loud snap. It was followed by a long scream from the man. I realised he had let go of my foot. I was about to get away when something in the way he kept screaming made me stop and look back. He was bent over the tree trunk. Somehow, his wet foot had slipped down in between them and his speed had made him lean on his trapped ankle just enough to break it. It was bent over at a crazy angle and looked totally wedged. He didn't seem so scary now, all laid down and crying like a baby. I didn't feel sorry for him though. In fact, I got the more angry the more he cried. I started to shout at him. I told him to shut up and I told him that he wasn't so brave now he didn't have the hoverglobs to help him. He stopped crying and looked up at me, his face all streaked with tears. He was older than I thought, with grey wisps in his hair. His tanned face was all wrinkled up and his teary blue eyes were almost closed from the pain he was in. I knew he was only crying for himself though. He shed no tears for all the people he had betrayed. There was no sympathy for Ivan or Janine. In a gaspy voice, he asked me if I knew who he was. I said his name was Collaborator, and he said not to call him that. He said he was to be called Hunter, because that was what he did. That just made me so cross that he could be proud of what he had done. I walked back to the riverside and picked up the big rock by the water's edge. Although it was a struggle, I hefted it over my head and stood over Collaborator, or Hunter, or whatever his name was. I reckoned if I dropped it on his head, that would be the end of him. I stood there and shouted that I was the hunter now. Cool as you like, he corrected me. He told me that as I was a girl, I would be called Huntress. That was it. I got so cross, he was about to have the worst headache ever. When I realised, he wasn't looking at me. I turned and looked back at the river. On the other side, two hover globs crested the hill and began to float their way above the water. They had their petals open and their red, angry eyes were fixed right on me. I cursed myself for not running when I had the chance. All the anger that I had towards Hunter switched to them. I ran towards the water and heaved the rock at them. The rock flew through the air and landed in the water in front of them. I missed them completely. The big splash must have dumped a load of water in the open fronts of the hover globs, though. They didn't like that at all. There was a crackling sound, and the nearest one dipped down too low to the water. The front acted like a scoop, and I watched the hover glob nosedive under the surface. There was more crackling sounds, and loads of smoke streamed out. There was one last crackle, and then it lay still. The eye on the other hover glob had turned from red to a sickly yellow. It did not look happy as it closed its front petals and slowly made its way carefully back over to the far side of the river. I turned to the collaborator. The pained look on his face had changed a bit. He looked so shocked that little me had taken down one of his hover glob friends. So now, I was standing over Hunter once more. He must have known he was helpless, and if I'd have had another rock with the last one, he would have been finished. He really looked scared as well. 
I had totally shaken his smugness that his hoverglob friends would look after him. So, once again, I know I should have just run away. I should have got as far from him as I could. But I didn't. I just had to know. So I asked them who they was, what they was, what did they want with the people they carried away. That was when he explained in his fast, gaspy voice that these were the new rulers of our world. They came from a world where there was very little water or food and they'd used their machines to travel across huge empty space. They could hunt us down with their hover globs or stay up in space and drop rocks down until everyone was dead. So he explained about how he'd been captured, about the choice he'd had to make when these machines had killed all his family and friends. So he had decided to do what he was told. His masters wasn't inside the hover globs. In fact, he had never seen one for real. But they controlled them from some far off place. They had told him to range out ahead of their invading army of hover globs. The machines didn't like the air, it was too damp for them. I wondered why they didn't make better machines. The hunter just sort of laughed and said how this wasn't the only world that his master had conquered, but it was probably the wettest. As he went ahead, he would trick his way into the trust of any people he met to find out where they was hiding. Then he would tell his masters where they could be found. In return, the master would give him food and keep him healthy. That's how he'd lived so long. He called himself Sir Fiver, which brought back memories of Ivan. I got all sad and angry again and wanted to get away from this horrid man. But then, I realised that while I'd been listening to him, the hover globs had surrounded us. I was trapped in a circle of them as they closed in through the trees. He started shouting at them, told them they should kill me. Then, he went quiet, as if he was listening to them, although I couldn't hear anything. He nodded once or twice, then pulled his foot out from between the logs, gasping from the pain of moving it. He lay down in the grass, with his leg resting at a crazy angle. I watched as one of the hover globs moved close. I couldn't see what it did, but when it moved away, his leg was straight. He stood up and put his weight on it, as if it had never been broken. He looked at me, and the smug look had returned to his face. He bragged about how much power his masters had, and about how he had made the right decision all that time ago. So, once again, he stood and listened to something I couldn't hear. Then he smiled and said out loud how good his masters was about how tired he was of ranging these cold lands and he would be so happy to go back to their home world. He looked at me and said he was going to enjoy a nice retirement. He was going to stop being a hunter and start being a breeder, whatever he meant by that. He tried to explain that so his masters could have as many people as they wanted, they had lined up lots of girls for him. I didn't understand, and he 
started to explain some more, but something made him stop. He said it was time to go. Is it better to be alive by causing so much death? He certainly seemed to be all right on it. In fact, he had a smile on his face as two of the hover gloves escorted him away to his new job. I felt suddenly alone when he had gone, standing there, surrounded, knowing it was my turn to make a choice. So here you are, with your angry red eyes and your speaking in my head questions. You wanted me to tell you my story, and I have. But now you've pulled all my memories out of me, I realise You've got the drop on me, haven't you? I've got no choice but to do as you say if I want to go on living. So I'll go along with you for now. I'll spy for you and tell you where those pesky humans are hiding. But I'm not the same as your last puppet. The humans might not still be there by the time you go to where I said. Meanwhile, I'll be finding out what I can about you, learning your weaknesses. You might think you're pulling the strings, but one day, when you're looking the other way, not keeping watch on little me, I'll be the end of you. My name is Roxy, and I'm a viber. A vibe from when the sky fell, and I'm not going to give up now. So for now, you can call me Huntress. That was Huntress, part one, by Peter Frost. The character of Roxy was read by Charlotte Frost. Coming soon. Listen to me. Quick! We haven't much time. Talians are coming for you. If you don't listen carefully, you'll be caged bait. Huntress, part two. <laughs>